will naturally lead me. Yeah, and that will naturally lead me to um, discuss how we can use foreign language models to predict the effects of variants. And I'll then spend some time talking about how we evaluated and compared our methods to other methods, both on clinical databases and experimental data sets. Uh, then I'll change gear a little bit and speak about uh, variant effect predicting from a slightly different angle and show how, how it can be used to study the different effects of alternative protein isoforms. And uh, finally, I spent some time talking about uh, future directions of uh, things we're interested in researching uh, further. And I would say up front that we're uh, very much open for collaboration. So if any of the things I'm uh, talking about today seems interesting to you, then uh, we'll really feel free to uh, approach me. Yeah, and I will also say that uh, if, if you if you have any clarification questions, then please don't wait. You can just uh, uh, go ahead and, and ask uh, the question. You don't even need to write in chat. Uh, so really uh, feel free. Um, okay, so let's start. So as we all know, the recent decade, it's, a decade has shown like quite astonishing um, improvement in deep learning methods, which nowadays are routinely used in many different types of applications. So anything from image segmentation and classification to the generation of entirely new images to mastering complex uh, games like chess and Go or real-time games like StarCraft and maybe more relevant for our purposes, uh, predicting uh, protein structure. Now a specific subfield uh, that deep learning has really started to, to kick off like very recently, only the past couple of years, is natural language processing. Where we want to uh, train models that have some understanding of, of human uh, language. Uh, so only a couple of weeks ago, Chat GPT was introduced, uh, which is a pretty remarkable piece of technology that allows users to engage in pretty much open-ended conversation responds to pretty much every query that you give it and even be i by the way i think someone should mute their microphone and hear some voices um okay uh to, to even like creative tasks like you know writing stories or poems to uh you know some more specific models that could uh, understand and answer mathematical questions or even write uh, computer code based on user specifications. So really all of these applications require the model to understand human languages quite uh, quite a good level. And at the heart of, of you know many of these uh, recent innovations is this idea that is called deep language models. Uh, and the idea is actually quite simple. So we just take a very large uh, collection of text, what we can call a corpus. And each time we isolate a specific, um, we take a specific piece of text and we do something called masking, which is to hide specific tokens in this text. For example, we could take, let's say, 15% of the words at random and just uh, mask them away. And then the task of the language model would be to predict the missing words in the text. Uh, then by comparing the uh, predicted text to the original text, uh, we can calculate a loss function and through back propagation, we do gradient descent and the language gradually improves this task of guessing the missing words. And it turns out that just to, to guess missing words in the text, uh, the model implicitly has to learn a lot of stuff about language it studies about uh, syntax and grammar and semantics and sentiments. So pretty much everything related to, to human language and it gets a pretty good understanding of, of the text. So once we train this model, we can then use it in a bunch of ways. We can either fine tune it on a more specific task or we can just use the, the embeddings that we get. For example, in image generation, uh, what people often do is just take the embeddings from a language model and then train another model that based on these embeddings will generate an image. Uh, and sometimes we can even just use it directly. For example, if you want to generate text, then that's exactly what this 
deep language models are trained to do. So we don't have to do any fine tuning or uh, using any other network. And the reason that this approach is so powerful is that uh, this pre training actually doesn't require any labeled data. We can just take any text that we can find online and use this process in a semi supervised manner. Uh, so, by training it on really uh, huge amounts of text, they become very, very powerful. So, going back to biology, if you want to apply these models to um, molecular biology, there is one insight that um, is really important. That is that when we talk about biological sequences, whether it's proteins or DNA or RNA, very much like text, there are just strings of letters. So in the case of an English sentence, uh, we could break it down to letters or <laughs> words. And in the case of proteins, we could break it to um, to amino acids, uh, whether it's combinations of amino acids or individual amino acids. In, in both cases, just a string of, of tokens. And therefore, we could use the exact same algorithms. Um, so that naturally gives rise to the idea of protein language models, which are trained in very much the same way. So for example, we could take Uniprof, uh, the, the database of protein sequences, which nowadays has over 250 million protein sequences. And again, we do the exact same thing. Each time we take a protein sequence, we mask some residues at random, and then we train a model to predict uh, the missing residues and uh, train the model. Uh, once the model is trained, what we end up getting is uh, this thing we call an amino acid substitution probability matrix. Essentially, uh, what the model learns for each position along the protein sequence uh, how likely is each alternative amino acid to be in that position? So in other words, what we get is the likelihood of every possible missing mutation along the protein sequence. Now, this model is trained on wild type sequences uh, of you know, protein sequences that have been selected throughout evolution in every organism that we have data for. It could be anything from humans to primates to plants, bacteria, viruses, really everything. Now we know that for those sequences that have been selected throughout evolution, one of the main forces that shapes evolution is fitness. And generally speaking, evolution uh, will disfavor um, sequence variations that damage uh, proteins. So that kind of like natural leads to the hypothesis that we expect damage mutations to be predicted as much less likely by uh, these protein language models. So in other words, uh, we hypothesize that we could use uh, these models to do variant effect prediction. Uh, so let me spend some time speaking about uh, this challenge. And to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'll start uh, by clarifying the terminology. Uh, when I say variants, I mean any unit of genetic difference between individual. Uh, for example, if we have some DNA sequence, we could have some letter where some people have an A nucleotide and some have a G nucleotide. Um, and maybe the sequence happens to be within a coding region that codes for a protein sequence. And then in this case, it could be uh, that we uh, substitute one codon with another, which leads to one amino acid to change into an another amino acid. And that would be called, that's what we call a nuisance mutation. Um, another property that is uh, quite important for geneticists uh, when they talk about variants is uh, what is called the allele frequency. And that is for a specific human population that could be Europeans, African, uh, East Asian. So some population, what percentage of people are estimated to have each of the two alleles? And just to give some intuition about uh, how even those you know, small missing mutations can have quite dramatic effects, uh, we could imagine that we have some functional sites in the protein. Maybe we have some residue that binds another molecule to be, say, another protein. And then by just substituting this single amino acid, you know, it could, could potentially completely destroy this binding and uh, you know, ruin the function of this protein. Uh, for example, there is a gene called SOD1. Uh, where some missing mutations, for example, a substitution of glycine into arginine at position 37, can cause a disease called ALS. It's a very severe uh, neurodegenerative disease that leads to paralysis and eventually death. So 
a very tragic consequence just because of this one amino acid swapped at the wrong place. So when patients walk into the clinics, um, you know, if they are suspected to have uh, a genetic disease, the first thing we want to do is to diagnose them. So the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, the ACNG, uh, they published a guideline that is comprised of a five-tier system with five labels, spanning all the way from variants which are certainly with very high likelihood pathogenic to variants that are uh, very likely to be benign, and some intermediate categories like uh, likely pathogenic or likely benign, or if we are completely clueless, uh, uncertain significance. So to determine which of these five labels we assign to each variant, we consider many types of evidence. Uh, for example, we can consider something that is called disease segregation, which is a very straightforward idea that if we uh, see in a family that all uh, the patients have, all, all the people with the disease have a specific variant and uh, all the healthy individuals don't have it, then you know, it's much more likely to be the cause of variants. Uh, but still, when you know patients uh, walk into the clinic, even after considering all lines of evidence, we still end up uh, very often with more than one candidate variant, which could be causal. And nowadays, in, in many catalogs of variants, it's still the case that most suspect variants are still categorized as these variants of uncertain significance. So one thing that people have done to try to address this challenge is to develop computational algorithms that try to predict uh, the effects of, of mutations and classify them as either pathogenic or benign. And throughout the past couple of decades, there have been really numerous methods that have been developed. And generally, uh, they will you know, fall into either the supervised or unsupervised categories. So supervised methods are trained on clinical databases with uh, you know, variants with existing labels, and they try to generalize from these variants to yet unknown variants. Whereas unsupervised methods, uh, you know, they don't require any label, uh, label data. Um, so for example, one uh, very common uh, approach for um, unsupervised variant effect prediction is a family of methods uh, that we call homology-based models. And these homology-based models will typically use uh, what is known as multiple sequence alignment, or MSA. So the idea is for each human sequence that we want to functionalize, uh, we'll, we will find all the homologs of this uh, sequence across different organisms and align them together and to create these nice profiles, which then allow us to estimate for each position how, um, how likely each amino acid is. Uh, so, for example, last year there was a model named Eve uh, that was published, and it turns out to be a very strong method. So, in this figure from day paper, you can see that it outperforms many other methods, both uh, supervised and unsupervised methods, even though it's an unsupervised method. Uh, but still, it's important to keep in mind that these homology based models have some uh, quite uh, significant limitations. And I think the most significant one is that they require this uh, multiple sequence alignment coverage. Uh, so for example, if provide predictions only for about 15% of human proteins, and within those proteins only for about 84% of the residues um, because of this requirement for good coverage. So for example, here you can see their prediction for the P53 gene, which is a pretty important gene. Uh, and still you can see that, you know, for many, many regions, in many sites, you have all of those white uh, blank spaces. So all of these cases, where they don't provide predictions. Um, so the current state of affairs is that, unfortunately, computational methods are still not considered uh, very reliable by clinicians, and they're very reluctant to use them. It's still the case that most suspect variants are of uncertain significance, and many patients don't get a clear diagnosis, which is you know, really a cornerstone of good healthcare. And variant effect prediction is still very much an open grand challenge. So this brings me back to the question that I posed at the beginning, can a protein language model do better than that? So in this work, we used uh, ESM-1B, which is a polling language model developed by Meta AI, 
formerly known as Facebook. Uh, they train it on all the important sequences in Uniprot. It's a 650 million parameter model. Uh, might not be considered super large in today's standards when we you know, speak about like uh, actual language models used, used in natural language. But for uh, the study of protein sequences, I would say it's still very much in the high end of uh, existing models. And it's been shown to be effective for many protein related tasks. So, you know, anything from uh, structure prediction to post translation modification to uh, detecting homologs, uh, many, pretty much anything involving protein sequence, uh, sorry, function or structure. So we use DSM-1B in a pretty uh, straightforward way. So for each query for in sequence, we just fit it into ESM-1B exactly as is. So we just took the pre-trained model. We didn't do any fine tuning. And then using um, this kind of like probability matrix that we get from ESM-1B, uh, for each mutation, we calculate uh, a score, which is just a log likelihood ratio between the probability of the mutated amino acid to the wild type amino acid. And we calculate these scores for every possible nuisance mutation in the human genome. So we end up with some 450 million uh, variant effect scores. And even before we do any evaluation, just by you know gazing at these kind of like maps that we get. So here you can see those um, log likelihood ratio scores that we get for three different genes, uh, we can still see some interesting patterns. Uh, for example, we could see that in a lot of regions, uh, we get these uh, dark colors indicating that there, isn't, it, there aren't many mutations with damaging effects, whereas other regions seem to be a lot more sensitive to mutations. And it turns out that it you know, overlaps quite well with uh, protein domains, which are the functional units of, of proteins. And that works even for regions that are outside of good MSA coverage. So here we use the definitions used by Eve, what they define as, as good enough coverage. And you can see that even in regions where Eve can provide uh, predictions, uh, we still recover many known protein domains. Now to actually evaluate uh, this approach, we first uh, considered two clinical databases. So we used CleanVar, which is uh, the most popular, you know, clinical database for variants is an open uh, platform, meaning that pretty much any group can submit their opinions about variants. And then we also use AGMP, which is a private database that requires uh, permission to use. Um, and they they use a, an entirely different approach. So they they do it in a much more centralized way. They use their expert opinion to try to um, decide for each variant whether it's pathogenic, given all the existing human, all existing scientific literature, literature about this uh, variant. And whereas CleanVar use the exact same five uh, categories recommended by ACMG, uh, AGMD are only interested in curating uh, disease mutations, DM, so they don't curate the non variants. So the first thing we did was to compare the distribution of the scores that we get uh, from ESM1B for four different uh, sets of mutations, two of which are expected to be mostly benign and two that are expected to be mostly pathogenic. So we used the pathogenic and benign categories from ClinVar. We took the disease mutations from AGMT. And as another category of like benign mutations, we took from NOMAD mutations with an allele frequency of at least 1%. So it's very unlikely that if the variant appears in more than 1% of the population, it would be pathogenic. So the first thing we see is that indeed we get a very good separation between the benign and pathogenic uh, sets. But we also see that we get pretty consistent distributions. So the two benign uh, distribution and two pathogenic uh, distributions seem to overlap very nicely. We also uh, looked at the distributions for all the different uh, labels in clean bars. So uh, we see that the likely benign mutations give you a distribution that is very similar to the benign, and likewise, the likely pathogenic is very similar to the pathogenic. Whereas if you look at the answer in significance, we see that it's all over the place. So to you know, try to dig a little bit deeper into the answer in significance variants, 
we uh, use a very simple Gaussian mixture approach. So we just fit two Gaussian components into this distribution, like you see here at the bottom. And here at the top, you again see those two distributions and you can see that they overlap very well with um, the benign and pathogenic uh, groups. So based on this simple analysis, we estimated about 60% of the variants of answering significance and clean var are benign and about 40% are pathogenic. So if you want to be really serious about you know, evaluating the performance of ESMLGs as a binary classifier of pathogenic or benign uh, mutations, we can look at these uh, rock curves uh, that you see here, which essentially tell you for each rate of for each false positive rate, what's your true positive rate? So, for example, if we look at the false positive rate of 5%, which is very much a standard that people use, we can see that we get a true positive rate of about 60% for the SM1B, both on the CleanVar and HGMT NOMAD uh, datasets. Whereas for EVE, we get about 50%, um, again, both uh, datasets. If you want, to get an overall score for the performance, we can just integrate under the curve and get the ROC AUC metric, which gives you about 90% for ESM1B and 88% for EVE, again, across the two uh, data sets. Now, of course, we didn't just compare to EVE, we compared uh, against 18 other uh, variant, of, variant effect prediction methods. And you can see the full um, benchmark results here. Uh, so in both CleanVar and HMT, we see that ESM1B outperforms the other methods, and that applies both to the ROC AUC and a slightly different variation of the metric called PRC AUC. I should note that when we do this kind of comparison between different methods, there is uh, this very important kind of like circularity problem that we need to address. So the thing is that uh, we often use the same evidence. Uh, for example, a lead frequency will be used for both as a feature in many variant effect predictors and for the labels for these, uh, for these uh, clinical databases. And the problem is even more severe than that. Sometimes we even have uh, direct leakage. For example, when you train supervised methods, they very typically will be trained on clinical databases. So trying to you know, evaluate their performance in the exact type of, of data sets, uh, sorry, the exact data set that they've been trained on is, is quite pointless. And sometimes we ha have leakage even in the opposite direction. So sometimes those groups that make, uh, you know, try to label those variants, they would take some, the outputs of tools into account. So to avoid this problem, when we, chose the 18 methods to compare against, we applied two very strict criteria that would avoid such bias. So the first criterion is that uh, we only compare to tools that are not trained on any clinical database. And the second, that they don't use a little frequency as a feature. Okay, but then you could ask, okay, so we evaluated against a much more subset of methods, but how do we know that ESM1B is really competitive to all the other methods that might violate these criteria, including many supervised approaches. So to overcome this challenge, we uh, appealed to a different type of um, benchmarks and we used what is known as deep mutation scans. Uh, so these are experiments that measure some cellular phenotypes as proxies for the clinical outcomes that we care about. For example, if we care about cancer, we might look at um, cellular phenotypes like the growth or proliferation of cells as a result of different mutations. Now it should be uh, made clear that when I speak about different types of scans, it, I don't refer to like a specific type of method. It's an entire family of, of methods. It could be done in many different ways. So generally uh, these methods have some pretty important advantages. So first, they are more objective. Uh, there isn't any subjective judgment in how we label variants. We just run the experiments and you know, write down the measurements. Uh, it also avoids this data circularity problem because typically variant effect predictors aren't trained on differentiation scans. And even, even if they use such data, it's relatively easy to just exclude uh, the specific genes that they've been trained on. 
But on the downside, we need to keep in mind that you know those cellular phenotypes that we measure are only proxies for the clinical outcome that we care about. And because those you know experiments uh, have limited generalizability and throughput, um, we get much uh, much fewer genes uh, for which we we get those measurements. So for our benchmark, we used 21 different uh, deep mutation scan assays across 12 unique uh, genes. So here on the right, you can see a comparison between ES and 1B and Eve uh, across uh, those 21 assays. So for each one, we just report the Spearman correlation between uh, the experimental scores to the scores provided by the models. And by taking all the assays uh, within the same gene and averaging them, we can also show the scores uh, for each one of the 12 genes. And if we average those uh, correlations, uh, you can see in dashed lines uh, that ESM1B slightly outperforms Eve. And here too, of course, we didn't just compare to Eve, we compared it to 45 different uh, run effect prediction methods. So in this case, uh, there weren't any limitations. So we compared it to any method that we are aware of uh, that exists out there. And still we're very happy to find out that ESM1B seems to outperform all the other methods. So to conclude the first part, uh, so yeah, I think it's kind of like we can safely say that ESM1B seems like uh, the state-of-the-art methods, and we show that both on clinical and deep mutation scan benchmarks. And more generally, it seems like deep language models are a very promising method approach for uh, variant functionalization for a bunch of reasons. Uh, first, it's fully unsupervised, meaning that we don't have this data circularity problem, and we can get very, uh, very good and unbiased estimates of how they actually perform. Um, unlike homology-based methods, uh, we have just a single model that can apply for every possible amino acid sequence that we give it and every possible missing mutation. So it's really, truly genome-wide. And you know, the research of language models, both uh, you know, generally in NLP and in biology, is a very active field of research that is showing like really tremendous uh, improvements. And the nice thing about it is that we don't even have to fine tune these models. So as soon as we get an updated improved model, we can just plug it in and immediately get uh, those updated uh, predictions. So to make sure that it's really available for the entire research community and for clinicians, we developed a web portal that provides all the pre-calculated uh, missing mutations in the entire human genome. So you can just query gene and get those Hit maps with uh, where you can see the scores for every mutation that you care about. And you can also just download the entire data set. So I, I put the link here uh, if you're interested. Um, yeah, maybe like before we uh, switch gear and, and move to the next part, if, if there are any uh, questions, now might be a good time to take some. Okay, I can just uh, move on to the next part. And again, if you have questions, then feel free. Um, okay, so now let's speak about how we could use uh, foreign language models as a variant effect prediction, predictor to study this phenomenon of alternative splicing and foreign isoforms. So again, to make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, let me briefly explain what I mean by alternative splicing. So as we know, genes are made of individual axons uh, with uh, some intronic sequences in between them that through this process of splicing are dropped away and we are just left with the axons. But the same gene can be uh, you know, spliced in this way into different versions of the same transcript. So some axons can be either included or excluded in different uh, RNA transcripts. Uh, so this is what we call alternative splicing. Now, I won't get into the biochemistry of how this works, but the end result is that we get this combinatorial situation where we have 
different subsets of the axons in different uh, RNA transcripts that are then translated into slightly different variation of the same protein. Uh, this is what we call alternative isoforms. So for example, we could have some protein domains that only exist in some of the uh, proteins, but not in others. In terms of the effects of variants, there are a few things that could happen. So in some cases, like you see here for this blue variant, uh, there isn't really anything interesting that is happening. You know, the only thing that happens is that this variant applies only to three out of four isoforms, but for isoform number three, you know, this variant doesn't even exist because, you know, the part of the effects is not even part of like the protein sequence here. But in other cases, like you see for the red variant, we could have something that is damaging uh, for the primary isoform, but in some of the alternative isoforms, maybe because they're missing some other uh, parts that interact with this region, and maybe this region is inactive anyway, uh, this variant is pretty much neutral and doesn't do anything. And in other cases, uh, we have we could have the opposite case where something is uh, neutral in the primary isoform, but maybe damaging in alternative isoforms. I would say that nowadays this is a pretty neglected, uh, you know, uh, topic of studies. So, um, existing uh, variant effect predictors don't really deal with this uh, very well. For example, homology-based methods. Uh, you know, because they just look at the homologs and, you know, these are all variations of the same protein with the exact same set of homologous proteins, it's not even clear that they could distinguish between the effects of, of different isoforms. Uh, but with language models, on the other hand, because they actually get a concrete sequence as input and at least in principle, I should like give you different outputs depending on the exact sequence that you give it, they could provide a good opportunity to study as a form of specific effects. Uh, yeah, let's skip those couple of slides. We'll go straight here. So to study this really at a genome-wide scale, we first define what we call isoform sensitive variants, ISV for short. The way we define it is we look at variants that are predicted to be damaging in the context of some isoforms, but benign in the context of other isoforms. So we use the thresholds of minus seven and minus eight which if you recall from you know, the early slides, this is pretty much where uh, you, know, you get a threshold between the benign and pathogenic uh, variants. And now we want to look just at like variants that have a, a significant difference between isoforms. So we defined, uh, we took a threshold of at least four different, uh, sorry, a difference of at least four in the scores that we get between the minimum and maximum scores that we get across the different isoforms for each variant. So a few interesting um, things we find out about those isoform sensitive variants. First, if we look at their distance from the nearest splice junction, we see that they are much closer to a splice junction than uh, variants that are cho just chosen uniformly. And that actually makes perfect sense if we remember that we expect you know, most of the interactions to be local. So it makes a lot of sense that variant that is by the spy site will interact with this kind of like region that is included or excluded and then will lead to different effects. Another thing that we find out is that those, um, the proteins that contain azoform sensitive variants are also much more likely to contain what we call Splice disrupted domains. So when I say splice disrupted domains, I mean you can see here two examples in this sketch that I showed earlier. So we mean those cases where a domain, rather than being included or excluded entirely, it's disrupted in the middle by these splicing events. And we see that that exists in 90% of the proteins with azoform sensitive variants compared to about 30% of all proteins. So we see that most of the effects are quite local, but there are some cases where we see uh, more outsized effects. So let me show you a couple of interesting examples. Here we see a gene, a protein called MAN1, which is a tumor suppressor involved in many different cancer types. Uh, so MAN1 has a primary isoform and also has a second isoform. And the difference between them is actually quite minor. So we just have a deletion of exactly five amino acids. So glycine, tryptophan, serine, proline, and valine, 
between position 149 to 153. And even though we have this very minor deletion, when we look at the difference in the scores, uh, predicted scores between these two isoforms, we can see a much larger region that seems to be affected. And we actually see a region that doesn't seem to be uh, very sensitive in the primary isoform, but very sensitive in the alternative isoform. So, sorry, to get some intuition about what might be going on here, we used alpha code to predict the structure of these two different isoforms. And we see that when we remove those five amino acids, we the predicted stru structure seems to introduce this kind of like pocket that we see here. So maybe what happens, again, this is just an hypothesis, but in the interesting one, we think what happens is that we introduce a new binding site maybe, or some other function region that just doesn't exist in the primary isoform. Another interesting case is in a proprotein called transforming growth factor delta three. So this proprotein is uh, cleaved into two separate chains. We have the latency associated peptide, the lap, and the TG TGF beta three uh, chain. Now we see that when we again predict the effects with uh, of different isoform with ESM1B, we we look at two um, isoforms here. Again, the primary isoform with both of these domains and isoform number two, which doesn't have the TGF beta three domain. And we see that a quite distant region all of a sudden becomes uh, insensitive with quite different scores, even though it's very far away from this uh, other chain. But again, we, when we look at alpha both against some intuition, we see that actually this kind of region that we see here is very close in the 3D structure to um, the TGF beta 3 chain. So it actually makes sense for it to be affected by it. So to summarize the second part about protein isoforms, um, we see that the same mutations can give very different predictions with respect to alternative isoforms, and that most isoform sensitive variants are close to splice junctions and seem to be enriched in. Uh, splice described domains. Uh, but in other cases, and I showed you a couple of examples, uh, ESM1B can detect distant or outsized uh, effects of alternative splicing. Okay, so before we move to the QA, I will say uh, just a few words about some future directions uh, that we're currently looking into. Um, so to think about like how this, you know, what else can we do with it? I think it's worth considering in general, like what are variant effect prediction methods even good for? In this talk, I pretty much exclusively focused on this problem of clinical diagnosis. And I should say that when we speak about clinical diagnosis, that applies pretty much only to what we call Mendelian traits. So these are traits where, you know, the very concept of pathogenic or benign variants even applies. But actually most human traits, and in particular, uh, the most common diseases that affect uh, high income countries are uh, fall into the category of complex traits. So in these cases, uh, rather than just individual variants with very strong effects, we have hundreds and sometimes even thousands of different variants, each with very small effects that in aggregate, together also with environmental factors, can determine the different risk of different individuals to get a disease. Um, so here I'm talking about things like diabetes, heart disease, um, you know, it could be uh, cancer or um, mental disorders like schizophrenia or neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. So, so really the most common diseases. And in the presence of those traits, um, we need to, to use a different kind of like uh, tool set. And there is a whole field called statistical genetics that uh, deals with these kinds of traits. And I'll speak about it a bit more in the next slide. Um, also how we could use ESM1B here too. Uh, another thing uh, that we think could be interesting is protein engineering and maybe gain of function research more generally. So for example, in immunotherapy, we take immune cells uh, and try to make them fight tumors. And there is a very active field of research of trying to optimize the genetic background of these immune cells. So rather than just trying mutation at random, we could use those 
of running the fake prediction tools to try to sample the space of possible um, genetic modifications a lot more efficiently. And like I showed with you know, the part of the alternative isoforms, it can also be useful just for basic science. So really trying to understand the function of proteins and the effects of variants in a more general way. So in statistical genetics, uh, what people usually do in methods like GWAS is to really study each time uh, each variant individually. So looking for variants that have different allele frequency between cases, people with the disease to controls, people without a disease. There is now an increasing recognition that this has some uh, important limitations. So two of these most significant limitations are in the presence of variants that are either rare or have uh, very weak effects. And in both of these cases, it's quite difficult to get enough statistical power to implicate uh, variants in the disease. Uh, we think that one of the very promising solution is to use uh, functional priors. So if we do take, for example, the predictions of ESM1B, um, we can immediately see which variants seem more or less likely to be causal. And we can use that to really narrow down the search space and make it uh, get much more statistical power when we try to implicate genetic variants. Uh, this is something I'm personally quite enthusiastic about. And uh, during my PhD, I actually developed a method called PWAS, Protein Wide Association Study, that uses a similar kind of approach. So that was before language models. So I used a more classic type of machine learning. But the idea was, again, to try to use those machine learning tools to estimate the effects of uh, variants and aggregate, aggregate all the variants that affect the same gene into a single score that then allows a gene uh, level rather than variant level statistical test with a lot more statistical power. And finally, another uh, idea that we think is promising is to try to deal with non-coding variants. So pretty much everything I've showed you today applies only to coding variants, which in actuality are only a very small part of the genome. And we know that actually most genetic effects are in the non-coding regions. Now, if you want to deal with those types of variants, uh, protein language models won't help us. We'll need to use another approach. So one idea is to take something analogous to a protein language model and try to make it work at the DNA level and develop DNA language models. Uh, now, there are a bunch of potential technical issues with trying to, um, you know, to to train those those models. I won't get into that. Just say that uh, you know these are important limitations, but we think that there are ways to to address them. And yeah, I think I'll stop here. I want to thank all my collaborators, uh, especially to Jimmy, who is the advisor, my postdoc advisor in UCSF, and to Vasilis, who's another PI in UCSF, who is actually the one in charge and the one leading this uh, project and all the other collaborators in UCSF and ASWAR and to my fellowships, of course. And I'd be more than happy to take questions. Thank you very much for the very nice presentation. I really love the figures you put together to explain the concepts. Um, I guess there's already one question in the chat by Umberto. Um, I can read or Umberto, you can also uh, ask uh, them. Yeah, I can, I can read it if you want. So, um, so Umberto asks, uh, could you comment on the relation between your work and the ESM1B, ESM1V work? Um, yeah, I think, I think he, he refers to the zero shot paper. Uh, in particular, ESM1V is trained on UREF90, while ESM1V was trained on UREF50. So ESM1V should, in principle, have better access to fine grained uh, mutation information. Yeah, so we actually looked at that. Um, yeah, thank you for this question. So, so we looked. Also, uh, the SM1V models. 
And we actually didn't find any significant difference between the performance of ESM1B and ESM1V, which is a slightly different variation of the same model. So we just decided to stick with uh, the more standard ESM1B. But yeah, but we, we didn't see a, a, a big difference. Um, and yeah, and more generally, I think our work is very much complementary to this uh, work by, you know, the meta AI group of Alex Reeves, uh, where they they studied um, variant effect prediction in a much more narrow sense. Um, so they showed a very nice proof of concept for, I think it was about 30 genes, 10 of them are human genes. Uh, that was on um, deep mutation scan. So, so, so our ideas are very much based on this work by Meta AI, and, and yeah, um, that, thank you for this question. Are there more questions? Oh, thanks from Umperto, I just see now in the chat. Because uh, I have one question. Do you think there is somehow a middle ground or a way to kind of go into the multimodal direction, kind of packing together amino acid sequences or DNA sequences or kind of something in the middle that could be of benefit for- Maybe, maybe like an assembly of like both DNA and protein language models or something yeah, like that. Yeah, or I'm not sure some, additional uh, essays that could be simply also used in a multimodal setup. If this is something you you maybe have even tried and didn't work, or this is something you would say could be interesting or could be very tricky. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely interesting and generally like, I think there are like, good reasons to expect that like as you include more pieces of evidence and like more models, at least in theory, like you should be able to get better performance. Uh, you know, sometimes it adds a lot of like complexity, so it should be like there is some trade off like between the other complexity, and sometimes it's not trivial. So sometimes you work really hard, you incorporate a lot of, of new data, and you know the improvement it improves slightly, but not by a lot. So you know it could be maybe not worth it. I, it's not like I don't have any hard data on that. Just mm -hmm. some intuitions uh, based on on past works. Uh, you should also keep in mind that it, like as you make those models more complex, especially if you try to incorporate like some kind of like supervised approaches, then you know then it becomes more more difficult to evaluate the, these models and you know get into this kind of like data circularity problem that I mentioned earlier. So sometimes it is better to to keep things simple. And it's actually interesting that we see that like this very simple approach, outperforms uh, some methods which are much more complex and they use like pretty much everything that exists out, uh, out there. Uh, and I think it's like kind of a trend that we see generally in machine learning. So, you know, mm -hmm. when we look at like state-of-the-art models like uh, GPT and stuff like that are actually incredibly simple. Like, you know, the, the network is very large, but the kind of like design ideas are, are so simple and, and narrow and still seems to perform so well when you scale it up. Uh, and, and, and design it in the right way. Uh, so yeah, these are just some thoughts, but I definitely think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting mm -hmm. direction. Some more questions? I see Dan typing, but yeah, I thank you from, from Dan. Because you mentioned like, um, yeah, th those large models are, are very kind of uh, unique that they have, uh, yeah, strong performances on, on applications that they were not trained on. I guess like this, it would be, or like if, if we keep on scaling them up, I guess there should be even more like interesting applications downstream. I'm just thinking out loud, but I guess there, yeah, maybe data will be the bottleneck at one point, but I guess it would be very interesting to see uh, what you can do with, with a model 10, 10 times bigger than anything won't be. Yeah, it is, it is quite interesting. Um, 
yeah, because like in the, the field of, you know, natural language, it seems like uh, we haven't yet, you know, reached the ceiling. Like it seems like they keep improving and improving as we scale them up. You know, with biology, we're more limited. Like you said, I think the main limitation is that we're more restricted with data. We have, you know, Uniprot and like in terms of protein sequences, that's about it. We, we can like pull out more proteins uh, from, from the ether. 